I've been running from this review for a long time. So let's talk about the OnePlus 10 Pro. But before we do that, this review is sponsored by Pella Cases. So stay tuned to learn more about this Canadian case company. The main reason that OnePlus phones have stayed in my pocket since they stopped being flagship killers is actually their cameras. I know that most people say they're not as good as the iPhone or whatever Samsung's latest flagship is, but to me, they have a ton of character and with the Pro models, three lenses that I love. The last few have all had a few extra modes that would be gimmicks to some, but I found them unlocking more creativity to me, so not a lot of complaints here. And really, who are we kidding? Mobile photography, as competitive as it is, more or less past a point of diminishing returns on flagship devices until I guess someone either starts jamming huge lenses, sensors, or just makes a giant breakthrough in computational photography. As a point and shoot camera, the iPhone is probably the most consistent, but right now, I think OnePlus is more fun. So let's start with the main lens and sensor. Not much has changed on the hardware side since last year's OnePlus 9 Pro, and that's a good thing. It's still the quick and large Sony IMX789 sensor that shoots 23mm equivalent images with the lens combo. It's great for general purpose photography, a little bit wider than the iPhone 13 Pro, but I actually think it helps it feel a little more vintage in its style, and it's something that I really, really enjoy. The new 10-bit color profile is extremely nice as well, and has more than enough color depth for me from a phone at least. There is a pro mode that allows you to capture raw files with 12-bit color depth, but I found that mode just in general to be a little less consistent in lower light. So unless I had a lot of great lighting like in this greenhouse, or if I was really trying to focus and take a shot I knew had real edit potential, I generally just used regular mode and avoided the pro mode for the most part. That being said, I do love the pro mode. I love that it's there, and I don't want OnePlus to change very much on it in the future. Pretty good. I guess this is probably the moment where I should explain the OnePlus color sciences because, because there's a lot. The first is called natural color calibration with Hasselblad and it applies to the main camera mode. This is, I would say, OnePlus's new default color system and it's the option that I'll probably be talking about the most in this review and most of these samples, at least before the edits. The next color mode that applies, it happens when you're in the Pro mode, which was previously called Expert mode for people who had a OnePlus 9 Pro. Anyway, if you take a standard JPEG in the Pro mode, it allows you to utilize actual Hasselblad sensor calibration and what the company was calling last year incredibly natural colors. At least that's what they were saying when they announced the 9 Pro. In theory, these colors should still be very rich, but more along a baseline to allow mobile photographers to edit them. That being said, they're JPEGs, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Of course, if you take that photo in pro mode as a raw, the colors aren't given any specific tuning, and then you can take that DNG file into your editor of choice and adjust it to your liking. It's very flexible, it's pretty great actually. There's a new option in the pro mode as well, it's called Raw Plus, and it acts a lot like Apple's Pro Raw or Samsung's Raw Expert, Expert Raw, something like that. It's obviously a raw file, but it retains some of Hasselblad's color tunings to give photographers a starting point, like the actual JPEG should. In Promise, it's a fun idea, but it's the slowest camera of the entire bunch, so most times I would just either shoot standard RAW for full control or the JPEG for the full effect of Hasselblad colors. On top of that, I have yet to even find an app that can effectively edit these, so most editors just take it as a RAW file without the color tuning, and Visco just takes it as a color tuned version as a JPEG. You know, as far as I can tell, there's no great solution for using RAW Plus just yet. Oh, and the, the craziest thing here is we're not even done with the color sciences. There's like I don't know, four or five more. If you go into X-Pan mode, which is secretly my favorite mode, there are two Hasselblad tune color effects. One is a pretty moody black and white effect that, you know, is fun, but black and white effect. And the other is a color mode that I actually found to be very, very Hasselblad-esque, but maybe a little more vibrant and saturated than the standard cameras with maybe a little more contrast. I actually like this color tuning the most out of all the cameras, to be honest, but that might just be because I like X-Pan mode. Beyond that, the 10 Pro and Hasselblad actually added new filters, there's three of them. They're called Radiance, Serenity, and Emerald, and they're fun, but they don't really seem that different than standard filters to me beyond their unique looks. So I didn't really shoot with them that often, but 
they're fun nonetheless, and if you enjoy the color tuning, it's, it's pretty cool. Overall, like I said, I use the regular mode more than pro mode, but if you're interested to see sort of computational photography versus RAW files on phones now that sensors are getting larger, David Amell has a really, really stellar video. I'll keep that one linked below. You can check it out after this, and I think it's worth watching as a follow-up for sure. That being said, even without the use of pro mode though, the main sensor delivered and is the star of the show. It's clear, it's sharp, and it pulls in so, so much color. It's fantastic. The HDR implementation could be improved, but for my style of shooting, I think it added more to the vibe than it took away. You know, a little blown out here and there. Kind of cool. I'm a heavy, shadowy guy anyway, so not a big issue for me. OnePlus has also tweaked its standard color science a bit this year, and it now seems a little more magenta-leaning compared to the OnePlus 9 Pro. I like this magenta flavor a lot better on the 10 Pro, but since I'm generally editing contrast and white balance in every photo anyway, that doesn't matter a lot to me. Still, just in general, I really like the color that comes out of the 10 Pro as a starting place to edit, and I find it really pleasing to work with. I'll admit that when I'm shooting mobile, I generally like punchy contrast and rich colors to kind of make up for the lower quality. So this phone is right up my alley, but I know that it won't be for everyone. The main sensor is also capable of capturing 48 megapixel images, but it defaults to 12 megapixels and having to turn on that larger megapixel mode manually was more of a hassle blad than it was worth. Sure, images are larger, you could crop them in a little more if you wanted, but they're still coming from a tiny phone sensor, so realistically, it's not adding that much to the experience. This video, like I said before, is sponsored by Pella Cases, a Canadian case maker whose cases are actually biodegradable. And I'm not just saying this because it's an ad, but Pella Cases actually feel super good in this hand. They're very, very soft, soft touch plastic, and way better than any silicone bumpers you think about slapping onto this thing. As you can see in this close-up, the Pella case, which is made up of a flax shiv and elastopolymer, feels very, very soft. The plastic, it's, it's seriously a huge step up in hand feel over traditional cases and way, way, way nicer than I would have ever expected from something that's actually biodegradable, which is huge. Pella doesn't have a case for the 10 Pro yet, but if you go to pellacases.ca, there is one for the 9 Pro and like every other Android phone in the market or iPhone, that's pellacases.ca. Seriously, tons of designs, meaning there's an option for everyone. However, I'm pretty partial to the simple colors like I've got here, and I just like that sort of robin egg speckling that the flax gives to it. It's, it's pretty nice, and the color choices are very awesome, very trendy this year. Anyway, if you want to check it out, there's a link in the description or you can just head over to pellicases.ca after the video. The next lens that I did use a lot though was the telephoto and this one was great but a bit of a disappointment compared to the stellar main lens and sensor. So you can still use it to great effect. It's a 77mm equivalent focal length, which is the same as the iPhone 13 Pro, but that's where the similarities end because OnePlus is only using an 8 megapixel sensor and it needs a decent amount of light to really shine and to work quickly. I'm so thankful that OnePlus included a telephoto since that's just like my favorite lens to shoot with on a phone, but next to the main lens it's just not as crisp, not as sharp, and not as great overall. It still blew me away from time to time. Some of the shots I took from it were really great and decent lighting, but they're just lower quality in the main lens. So, you know, it's okay. And once the sun goes down, you, you really have to hold yourself steady. There's nothing overly bad about this telephoto. It works, it gets the job done, but it's the camera area where OnePlus definitely stands to improve the most next year or even later this year if it's actually going to do another flagship halfway through the year. Maybe we'll go back to the T series, who knows? The ultra wide needs a little improvement too. Initially, I was upset that OnePlus actually stepped back the quality of the ultra wide this year to implement the new 150 degree ultra wide angle mode. Uh, you know, at first blush, it was a little blah. It wasn't like, oh no, 150 degrees, I'm so excited. But actually, the more I started to use it, the more it unlocked itself. The fisheye lens was cool. It was a little pixelated, so more of a stunt than anything super usable, and you can't use it in video, which is arguably where I think it would be the most fun, imagine, that'd be awesome. But that actual 150 degree ultra wide mode, once I was used to it and started playing with it more, I was getting a great, great feel for ultra, ultra wide photography, and I definitely understand now why OnePlus added it. Sure, it's a little gimmicky, but you can do a lot with it, and it unlocks a new style of photography on your phone, which is never really a bad thing. 
unless it actually takes away an old style, which is kind of what happened here. This time around, there's no autofocus on the ultra wide lens, so it can't do macro photography. It's not something that I would do all the time on my phones, but it was nice to have, and it's definitely going to be a trade off. Macro versus 150 are both a little gimmicky to most people, so choosing one over the other, hard to pick. I guess I'm happier with the 150, but I'll miss the macro, there's no doubt about it. The final mode that I spent a lot of time with, actually probably too much time, but it's so sick that I love it, is X-Pan mode. It's awesome. It allows you to take these crazy wide panoramas, basically cropping the main sensor in half to take 23 megapixel images with a little extra Hasselblad color tone on top like I was talking about, and it is fantastic. It's so good. I'm in love with it. Seriously, it's more filmic than a regular camera, and obviously I can't afford an X-Pan film camera because they cost $6,000 roughly, even more if you want all the lenses, but to me, just having the ability to whip this out of my pocket and just shoot X-Pan wide photos and play with that epic framing and that sweet, sweet composition that that you know, X-Pan mode allows is hard to go back to, and I, I'm kind of obsessed with it, and I have been obsessed with it ever since they put it on the 9 Pro. It's incredibly fun. The photos still look good blown up on a computer and they have great color. I've literally retooled my entire Instagram just to be about X-Pan mode. So yeah, I'm, uh, I kind of fell for that one pretty hard. Oh, but I will say that I know it's not for everybody. So don't think about that as like a buying decision. Just if like, you know, you love X-Pan mode, it's here, baby. And it's great. Overall, I kind of love this camera system. It's got a lot of different modes, provides mobile photographers with lots of different options. And I think if you want to, you can get a ton of performance out of it. The pro mode is actually pretty intuitive to use with one hand, which I do like. I should have mentioned that earlier, but we're putting it in here. There are two weaker aspects of the phone though, and that's portrait mode and the selfie camera. Selfie camera is kind of great in daylight, but as soon as it gets a little lower, the camera doesn't hold up as strong. And I felt like he's even brightening my skin a little bit. so. I don't know how much I would trust it with darker skin. Portrait mode was fine, but you can't adjust the depth blur in post, which is something you can do in Apple, Samsung, and Pixel phones. So you've got to capture it really well in camera the first time, which is not something I always remember to do in portrait mode because it's software. Generally, it can be tweaked in post and I can just edit the blur to a more pleasing level afterwards. The last thing I'll say about the portrait mode is the cutouts could be better, especially when Alex's hair and some of the photos, it's just like, and this looks very fake unless you turn the blur down quite considerably to the point where it's almost not taking portrait mode shots and you might as well just shoot a raw and try and edit it in post because I think you might have better luck there. But yeah, as a little street photography tool, I love having OnePlus camera in my pocket and as you can see from all these samples, it can take great photos. Oh, I'll also mention, I guess, just during this review, I almost shot 2000 photos. So lots and lots of samples to go through. Um, and you can find more in a link below to a Google Drive with all the full 10-bit HEIC files and some raw files. If you actually want to check those out, I've got them there. Before we wrap up this video, I'll also touch on design. And I was lucky enough to get the phone in the Emerald Forest variant. It's green. Um, <laughs> but this matte glass and that sparkly sort of green hue that it gives off is really great in contrast with the dark metal of the camera bump expertly. I didn't expect this phone to look or feel as nice as it does, but it's actually a pretty big step up over the 9 Pro in my eyes. I liked the 9 Pro's little camera bump and how classy it was, but I like this one a lot more than I thought I would, so that's that. The only issue with this giant camera bump is that sort of sometimes when you're just absentmindedly holding it, it might slide down and your fingers might hit it because it's so soft and so like subtle against the phone. Um, and that just means you're wiping fingerprints off your camera quite a bit. In terms of software design, I'm a little less pleased with what OnePlus has brought to the table this year. The company has been pretty non-committal on software updates ever since it you know, created its own sort of bespoke take on Color OS with Oxygen OS plus Android OS 11, but then it actually replaced that with basically the actual Color OS this year, which is a year later, and then followed that up with an announcement that they're gonna be backtracking without any clear mention as to what that backtrack will actually look like. 
You know, are we heading towards material you Android you know, stock like we used to? Or are we going back to what stock was when OnePlus used to call stock Android stock Android around Oxygen OS 10 or 11? No, yeah, just Oxygen OS 10. It's not that I'm actually out here cating ColorOS either. I think it's fine and on most Android devices I'm running Niagara Launcher on them anyway outside of the review period. So the minimal yet colorful look of the newest version of Oxygen OS does fit in there quite nicely and I like how the notifications look. However, I just wish the company would finally hurry up and show us what the next update is going to look like and then commit to it for like at least two years, you know? And if you could play nice with material use like color adapting principles or just material design in general, I think that would be really great because the Pixel on Android 12 looks fantastic and has the best software on Android right now, period. It is delicious. That's all I really have to say about the phones. If you feel like I missed something, I actually watched a review the other day from Kevin the Tech Ninja. He goes over some of the things like gaming, some other aspects that I haven't touched in here more specifically. So if you liked this video, make sure to like and subscribe, check it out, and then head over to his, and I'll link that in the description. It's Kevin the Tech Ninja's OnePlus 10 review. It's really great. Anyway, peace, and if you don't want to watch that, I've got a couple of other videos here that you can just check out and uh, you know enjoy mobile syrup content. I'm Brad Bennett, and I'll see you guys in the next one. All right, last time. The main reason...